Hello, I'm Valerie Babb. I want to tell you a story about a community that once lived here in Georgetown. That Georgetown looked nothing like the Georgetown we see today. Not as fancy or expensive, not as affluent, and perhaps, most interestingly, not as white. In fact, the Georgetown that we will remember in this program was one of the most important black communities in the city. That community was marked by its pride and self-esteem, its love, and its ability to make everyone who lived here feel part of a very special place. This is Black Georgetown Remembered. My grandmother um, tells me that she was about four years old at the end of slavery, and she came from Rockville. My, my grandfather was a slave in Montgomery County, and uh, he came to Georgetown about 1865. My grandfather was a native Virginian from uh, Amosville, Virginia, in Rappahannock County. Uh, the story is he left home as a young man with 25 cents in his pocket, somehow got to Washington and uh, put himself through school, became a, a physician. The Georgetown community has a long and rich history, and the achievements of its black residents are a central part of that history. Long before the Civil War, this once thriving commercial center on the Potomac River was home to a large, self-reliant, free black community, even though slavery also flourished along Georgetown streets and wharves. Hundreds of black men and women settled in Georgetown, raised families, and established businesses, schools, and churches. Mount Zion United Methodist Church on 29th Street is the oldest black congregation in the District of Columbia. The first U.S. Census in 1790 listed 34 free blacks as heads of families in Georgetown. By 1810, over a third of the city's population was black, most of them slaves. This proud, vibrant community was also made up of free blacks like Libby Adams, William Fields, Millie Gant, and Joseph Moore, who first earned his freedom and then opened a market. Alfred Lee, owner of a prosperous feed store at 29th and M Streets, was one of the richest blacks in the city. When he died in 1868, he left an estate of over $100,000. After the Civil War, many more blacks settled in Georgetown. Between 1860 and the 1880s, the black population jumped from 1900 to nearly 5,000. But by the turn of the century, Georgetown was in economic decline. The village slipped into a quaint lethargy in the shadow of Washington. Georgetown became a community of sharp economic contrasts, rich, middle class, and very poor. But the black community maintained its historic energy and independence. Led by men like Alfred Pope and others, it boasted an impressive array of doctors, musicians, teachers, craftsmen, and day workers who kept their pride despite the indignities of racial segregation. The strength of the black community was in the diversity of its people, churches, and businesses. This wonderful mix of urban life helped Georgetown sustain one of the most remarkable black communities in the history of the nation's capital. Just about every occupation covered was represented by, some, by a black man. We had coal yards, we had uh, delicatessens, we had uh, in professional groups, we had undertakers, we had pharmacists, we had doctors. Uh, so that there was a, just a mixture on all levels, professional, federal, and otherwise. For one thing, we had a lot of entrepreneurs here. People were engaged in so many different kinds of businesses. Those who had horse and wagons were doing moving. They were going downtown in drayage, bringing the materials back and getting salvage out of that with the cardboard, the newspaper, the wood. And all, also some would actually go around and buy up rags and newspaper. Then you had others who engaged in coal and ice and cut wood. Now we had a very unusual man who was blind. They called him Blind John Ransom, who had a place at the corner of 27th and O Street. And he had an ice axe 
which is somewhat like a hatchet. And he could stretch his hands on the ice from one corner to another and then mark it and cut it and come very near giving you 25 pounds of ice. And my grandfather was affectionately known as the mayor of Georgetown, Charles, Charles Turner, because he had helped so many people to get jobs. Well, my dad was just my dad. You know, it never dawned on me that he was a doctor until I guess I must have been about six. I can remember people coming to the door with sick children, or even they were sick. Sometimes they were cut. And no matter what time of day, even though Dad had regular office hours, they still came any time during the day. I guess every day somebody was coming in emergency for one thing or the other and he would treat them, no complaint. One thing that we had, we had a billy goat, and I think the Jacksons, they had goats. I think they had two goats. But we had a wagon with ours, and my dad used to use it to go get ice and anything that we needed. In fact, at uh, Thanksgiving and Christmas, my mother was a pretty good cook, and she would cook turkeys, and we would deliver them in the in the wagon. And of course, then you had your tailors. You had some tailors that were really bushelmen. They could make a suit to fit a custom suit. Of course, then you had the others who were just cleaners and pressers. You had your plasterers, your bricklayers. And of course, we also had bootleggers. We had number writers and we had number runners. The Warren boys, who were noted bootleggers and numbers. Now, the unique thing about the Warren boys, they were the only one who could afford the Cadillac car, and they had the touring type car, they had the curtains up there. And I was small, I remember many a day the Warren boys would be going up and down I Street, 27th Street, being chased by the police. But the funny thing, neither one could do over 35 miles an hour, and the bootleggers chasing, they had one guy up there that would get on the front end of the police Model T. When he got close enough, he'd take a leap and leap off on the back of the bootlegs car. <laughs> That's the truth. <laughs> and that was a common occurrence. It reminded the date of uh, Al Capone in Chicago. But the Warren boys was Al Capone of the bottom in Georgetown area. Though terribly exciting, these times were hardly representative of life in Georgetown. There, the black community would be overwhelmingly marked by two dominant traits, hard work and sacrifice. Everybody struggled and worked hard to make a living. That is right. And my father, of course, he worked for the district government, but he drove teams and that's a dollar a day, dollar and a half, two dollars, I guess, something like that. And things were up. And then the wives would help the husbands with the children and all. The most of the wives stayed home and took in laundry and the, to, to make ends meet and read the children. That was, that was the thing that kept us together. And uh, our parents saw that we had food when they didn't have it. We had beautiful parents, mother and father. My mother done domestic work, washing and ironing in the home and my father was a porter in a store. And that living took care of us. How, I will never know. My mother was able to give two of us piano lessons. I know my parents worked very hard for me. My father worked not only in the government, but in the evenings, part-time, uh, in, uh, you know, uh, bartending and, and uh, doing those kinds of things so that my sister and I could go to school and go on to college. We never discussed whether we wanted to go to school. That was it. They had a rule. We work for you, you go to school for us. We were always told that education was your way of accomplishing more than your parents did. Uh, my two older sisters, they went as far as the fifth, fourth and fifth grades, something like that. And then they stopped school 
and went to work to help the family so my younger sister and I could go to high school. It was through their aid and help that made the family progress as well as it did. And I love them down to the grave. Both of them are gone on now. They have passed. But it was through them we got high school education. George Towners worked hard to make life better for themselves and their families. But despite their best efforts, for many, the struggle was rough, especially during the hard times. As I remember, to heat, to heat our houses, we should go down to the Washington Flower Company on K Street and we'd take the corn cobs and this would be heat for the house. Or we'd uh, catch the coal trains coming through here, bringing um, coke for the old gas house down on Virginia Avenue where Watergate is now. Oh, well, when the coke wasn't on the ground, we'd Jump up on the train and knock some off. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> and they would, when they would dump the ashes, then the people would pick the cinders from them. And after picking the cinders from them, then they would sell them for 35 cents a bushel and also take some home to keep their own homes warm. As a kid, for to make money, I always made money, and I had to keep it and hide it because... Uh, I did not starve, and uh, uh, I had a wagon, and we'd go down there, and you could catch a truck that's getting ready to dump, and you could say, this is mine, and nobody would bother you. That whole pile was yours. Well, I soon learned that it was better to catch the trucks that had uh, come from families that burned hard coal, because their cinders were more firm, and there was a lot of coal in there that actually wasn't burned. And I could uh, pick them and uh, got home, wash them off, and it was almost as good as a, a, a bushel of coal. And I kept about seven, eight bags of that in basement and sell them, you know. Throughout its history, Black Georgetown would be a community in the fullest sense of that word. Though never wealthy, the community remained strong enough and willing enough to help each other, to care for each other. I imagine everyone was poor, but you didn't feel that you were poor because everyone was in the same boat, you know? Nobody knew it. Everybody was poor, but nobody knew it because every, everybody helped everybody. If you had someone living next door to you that wanted something, you had it, had some, you gave them something. When you go to the store, if the uh, grocer knew you, you might buy just a little of it, but he'd give you a lot of it. You pay for a little, and he'd give you a lot. And it seemed as though after my uh, father passed, everyone just seemed to just take me under their wing. Everybody called me Little Millicent, <laughs> even the teachers and whatnot. I remember when my mother was sick, she was sick sometime. And the different friends of hers and the organizations used to appoint people to sit up with you at night when you were very sick. When my mother died, uh, my father was very young. Uh, my mother died when I was 14. And my, my mother died at 32. She was very young. And uh, he had three daughters. I have two sisters. And I'm the oldest of the two. And um, he was sort of at a loss as to how to take care of us after she passed. So we had 20 mothers. Everybody on the block was our mother after that. Everybody here had, had been here for a couple of generations. There were no strangers. That's, uh, that's something I should say. There were no strangers in, in Georgetown among the black community. You knew not only which barbershop person went to, you knew who their barber was. You uh, wanted to tease somebody, you knew everybody's mother's name. <laughs> it, was, uh, it was remarkable. 
And during the hot weather, people used to take their blankets out and stay all night. Some even had assigned themselves spots as they used to say, that's my apartment. And this is, this is really what they would do. And nobody feared being attacked or their houses broken into or anything like that because everybody knew everybody. Everybody corrected you if you were wrong. There was no such thing as doing something and your mother not finding it out. And you were punished at home as well as by the person who saw you do it. And I think that makes a difference in children growing up and having respect. Well, it was, it was a uh, strong community. I think the uh, relationship between uh, the people that lived there was very, very strong. We all had a lot of respect for one another, and I think that made, I guess, better men, better women out of some of the people that came out of Georgetown. And it was especially important in those days to maintain one's self-respect, for Washington, D.C. was a segregated city. When I was going to high school, they had segregated schools, okay? Uh, Western was white. Dunbar, Armstrong, and Cadoza were the only black schools. With um, Dunbar was academic, Cadoza was clerical, and uh, Armstrong was, if you were more in a trade, then they had uh, Phelps, which was a vocational for the guys, and Martha Washington, which was a vocational for the girls. And those were the only high schools we had. Like we'd go to a baseball game. It was 25 cents to sit in the bleachers up at Griffith Stadium. So why would you pay 10 cents to ride up there on the streetcar when that 10 cent represented a hot dog and a Coca-Cola? So it's better to turn around and run. You run up there to save that dime. But sometimes, if you were running through the street, the policeman would pull you over and say, boy, what you steal? And so he'd pull you over, and you'd just say, I'm going to the ball game. He says, you sure you didn't steal nothing? Yes, sir, I'm sorry. I haven't stolen anything. And then you turn around and go. But whenever the policeman saw you running, they always thought or they wanted to assume that you had stolen something because the policemen were brutal around here then. They would lock you up for anything. There's, there was a, uh, a 10 cent store, Woolworth, Kresge, one of the two. Uh, midway in the block between Wisconsin Avenue and 31st Street on the north side of the street. And I stopped in, I had money in my pocket, I wanted to buy a piece of pie. And the woman wouldn't give me the pie. She says, we don't have any clean plates. I said, well, wash one. I'm about eight years old. I don't understand quite what segregation's about. I had money. I should be able to buy this. Uh, it, and I never did get the pie, and it wasn't for years that I understood why. With segregation, you knew where you belonged. So you stayed away. It was, it was pleasanter to stay away than to be put out. It didn't make any difference what you looked like. They knew who was and who wasn't, and it didn't let you in. Though segregation may have pushed the community together, Georgetowners seemed to sincerely like each other and needed very little encouragement to create their own self-identity. We were always, we always thought we were better than the people in Washington. We really did. We, if you came from Georgetown, you were just Georgetown. That was it. You didn't ever become Washington. And even though I've lived in Washington all these years, I still think of Georgetown. And everybody else does the same thing. When I went to Dunbar, um, if you said you were from Georgetown, them was fighting words. Oh, yeah, it was uh, like a turf battle. Um, males did not come from other parts of town into Georgetown to see girls. And if you did, you were brave. Well, I can remember being a outsider, uh, just, just living across, uh, just, just across the Elm Street Bridge. And uh, in order for me to come over to see the girls without having to fight on that bridge, I would wade across the creek while the fellows were on the bridge and I could get around them, you know.
uh, let me tell you about Rock Creek. That's where we, we, did, we spent a lot of time in Rock Creek. Uh, during the summer, we would go down between the two cemeteries, Mount John Cemetery on this side and Oak Hill on this side. And right at the, right at the foot of the, of the path was a little stream that we called Shankalo. And we skinny dipped in there. Oh, I can remember sleigh riding down between those two graveyards up there at Q Street and going straight into the creek, sled and all. And then wondering how, how I was going to tell my mother what happened to me. Uh, my father recalls having little dances at the Oddfellows Hall, which was at 21st, uh, 28th and Dunbarton Avenue. And he was a classmate of Duke Ellington. And so Duke Ellington's band used to come, you know, and play. And I think they charged something like 10 or 15 cents back in those days. We used to go up to theater on 26th Street. It was called the Blue Mouse. Used to go every Saturday afternoon to matinees. I think at that time it cost you a nickel or a dime. And we'd stay five, six hours, see replays, cowboys sit up on the back of the seat and ride with the horses. Well, you know where uh, 2700 Block O Street is. You know where the Rose Park Playground is. Well, I spent all my waking days there, see, as, as, as an 11 year old kid. Because it was a great playground. It was a big playground. It had everything. It had tennis courts, basketball courts, and baseball. That's where all the life was at Rose Park Playground. Uh, we had Mr. Anderson and Mrs. Violet McKinney were the instructors at the playground when I was going there. And they had clay tennis courts, and they had a little playground house. They had all kinds of crafts, all kinds of games, and it was just a happy time. We'd occasionally put on little plays and whatnot, and had two of the best tennis players at that time in the world, but they were black at the time, couldn't go play tennis with the tournaments. M Margaret and Rome Peters. One day the playground teacher saw me and uh, she said, oh, how are you doing? I said, I'm doing all right, only I can't get on the court because the boys won't let me on. And she said, well, I'll see that they let you on. They would play uh, one set and whoever won the set would remain on and then the other person would have to get off. So when I got on, I never had to get off because I beat all the boys down there. And my sister was a little shy, and she didn't come out like I did. And then I encouraged her to come on. I said, you can beat them too, so let's go. And we got on there, and we'd play doubles with me. We beat everybody that came along. My sister and I won the doubles championship for 14 years. People wouldn't play us when they heard the Peter sisters were coming. Oh, no, I'm not getting in that, no. <laughs> so uh, that's the way they called us Little Pete and Big Pete. And everyone now see they'll say Little Pete and Big Pete. And of course, the tennis courts were the main focus. And the tennis courts were integrated because we had some distinguished people who played tennis there, including Gene Kelly, the movie star. And at one time, they brought signs up there and placed on the courts for colored only, which we promptly destroyed. And Dr. C. Herbert Marshall and... Uh, Dr. Ed B. Henderson, they got a petition together and it was entitled Recreation. However, they hyphenated RE and made it Recreation. And we had neighbors to sign it. And in signing that, we made this the first integrated playground in the District of Columbia. Despite the general segregation throughout the city, Georgetown remained a racially mixed community that was fairly equally divided among white and black families up to the Second World War. If there was racial tension between neighbors, it did not keep them from depending on each other and even enjoying each other's company. Our next door neighbors were white, June and Nancy, and they couldn't understand why we didn't go to school with them. They went to Weston High School. We went to Dunbar. Well, why don't you go to Weston? Because Weston does not allow us to go to school there. We go to Dunbar. Only we play together every day. Whites and black live side by side to each other. When there's such, such thing as a black block and a white block, they all were intermingle in the same block. Because when I lived on 25th Street, there were several white 
right next door to me with a white family and a black family and another white family. And uh, across the street, there were white and blacks living together. Because I, I grew up with uh, one of the great athletes around here now, and that was the Gallagher, Joe Gallagher. And he coaches St. John basketball right now, but we were kids together. He lived around the corner on K Street, and I lived on 25th Street. But we played together, shoot marbles together, things of that sort. So we didn't think about he was white and I was black. We went our separate ways as we got older, of course. But after school, we were always together. And of course, uh, there were some white boys that I played with up there at 20, 27 Q Street, Buddy and Don Campbell, and we never knew the difference. We fought and swam together and all, right there. But the discrimination, you began to realize it, was during the war when the white people realized that this was indeed a place that they could buy very cheaply and at a high profit. And that is when the mass evictions and all took place. Uh, I, was in, I was riding the streetcars. The streetcars were around on P Street then. I was going to, going to school. And um, there were two real estate men sitting behind me. And um, one of them said to the other, we are going to get all of the blacks out of Georgetown. They came through here with condemnation notices and on just, you know, I mean, all of Poplar Street, all of East Place, many of the houses on 26th Street, on tw down 27th Street, they just condemned. They were condemned by the city. And, and it, <clears throat> it wasn't something that, that, uh, uh, that the city did with, with, with any level of hostility. This was orchestrated. People said, hey, look, you know, we, you know, they, we think we can turn Georgetown into a more profitable real estate investment. Uh, but we don't want to be, I, I, I mean, I can only imagine. <clears throat> we don't want to be the bad guys and turn out these families. We want the city to come in and condemn the houses. And then we can say, oh, what a shame. And they just, you know, they left. Same thing happened to Foggy Bottom. Society decided to come to Georgetown, and they bought the houses, and they would give the people such a little bit. I mean, it, 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 was, it was like night and day. There was a fella, I remember Joe Bundy and I played on one of the softball teams, 12 and under. We won the Region A. You know, we, we were a good softball team. The next year, they had, taken, they had taken out so many houses and so many families, large families with children, that we could not field a team. No children. The Rose Park Warriors, no more. They're gone. Don't have enough people to play softball, to field a community softball team. You know, with Georgetown, this was my home. And all, of, all the people here were my friends. We were friends. We were like one little, one group. If somebody took sick in your house, you didn't have to ask. Another neighbor would come or several neighbors would come to help. I'm living in a very difficult area now because, and most people that I talk to from Georgetown say the same thing because we were family. Georgetown people were family, but where I, li I live, I've been out here, yeah, I've been in this house 40 years, May the 5th, and it's just a diff different atmosphere altogether. But we were poor, we were poor, but we lived, and life, it, it brings tears to my eyes, it hurts me. To, we were actually hurt, and um, when, Sometimes when I'm to myself, I think about the things that happen here in Georgetown and the way I am now. It's all together, different, different type of people all together. We were a different type of people. We live, we help one another. We were poor, as I say. We worked hard. I worked. I went to school. But every summer, I had a job. I babysit. 
In fact, all of us, we used to go around these apartments knocking on doors. Kew Garden, I worked at Kew Garden Tea Room, $7 a week. As a, a vegetable girl, I was just a kid going to Francis Junior High School. But we worked. And uh, then uh, the only segregation that we had in, in Georgetown, we just didn't go to the same schools. Because white, we played with white. White kids slept in my, in my house when we lived up on Q. One boy in particular, I can't recall his last name, he was, my, my mother took care of him. He stayed with us. And we just lived. But uh, and when we were came, when the people came in and pushed us out, it was a hurt. And it's still a hurt. It's still a hurt. The houses were not actually demolished because the, the builders tried to uh, salvage as much of the, of the old homes as they could. And the way that they remodeled them was a wonder. Was, and we just, it would, we would stand in awe and watch to see how they would leave the front, the exterior, and just exchange, and change the interior to those homes. And we would say, oh, look, that's where so-and-so used to live. Who would have thought that house would look like that? And that type of thing, you know. But uh, still, we missed the people. We missed them. As it is, our church now is the only black thing in the block. The, the Georgetown that I knew is not here now, except for the churches. Church was the main place for, for black people, I would say. They loved, they waited for Sunday to come around so they could go to church, meet their old friends, and there wasn't any distinction in a church, because that was really our seat of activity, the, the black churches. So no matter what, to me, no matter what station in life you were, when you come to the church on Sunday, everybody felt they were equal to each other. Although I'm Baptist, I would go to the Methodist church, and the kids of the Methodist church would come to our church. Then we'd go around to the Catholic church. Then we'd go up to come around here to Jerusalem. So we all knew each other, and we'd all go to each other's churches. And Before the word ecumenical became prominent, these churches were all ecumenical because we used to go to Church of Epiphany and sing and enjoy ourselves and we used to ask members of Church of Epiphany to come to our churches and sing. We would sing at our morning service and finish the anthem and then in our robes we would run down here to Jerusalem to come into their choir to help them to sing. I A lot of our lives centered around these churches and we always were 
busy putting on different plays and weddings. The churches were very active here in Georgetown. And we just, it was a very big social part of our lives and a close part of our lives. A handful of black families remain in Georgetown, but the most visible link to the past is the churches. The black churches stand today as powerful reminders of their own importance to the black community and as buffers against a fading legacy. It's our heritage. It's our heritage. Our four parents slaved and worked to get this bill. And this is the third church on this corner. I played for the cornerstone laying in 1922, this building. Something that your four parents have slaved for, worked for, why should we give it up? It's a heritage for my children and my children's children. And I appreciate what the old folk, I know what they did. They would get out there and sell watermelon and um, fried chicken and chitlin dinners and all that, try to keep this church on this corner. And that's why it's, it's a heritage to me. It was in the Mount Zion Church Cemetery where runaway slaves once shivered in the cold, awaiting their long ride to freedom. In fact, that one secret spot is now a National Historic Landmark in recognition of its proud legacy as a signpost for human struggle the world over. It is interesting to look from the past toward the future, to take the memories that linger here and compare them to our communities. Will we find on reflection as rich and loving a past? Will we give to future generations as full an understanding of who we are and what we long to be? I love Jewishtown. I still love it as much as I did when I was growing up. Well, I'm, I'm very, very proud of my roots in Georgetown. And uh, every occasion that I have to mention it and to, to brag about it, so to speak, I do. Uh, Georgetown is, is really home to me. I think everywhere I went, I knew that someday I was going to come back. Because I miss that part of my life. We do very well. We get along very beautiful now. But they don't have that love that we had then. I wish they had stayed and all of them had stayed. <laughs> yeah, that was, those were the days. Oh, yeah.